like to introduce you to Amy Mulray Walslet. Did I say that correctly? Thank you. And her uh, topic is getting to know your congregation through data. Amy is the director of membership and welcoming at All Souls Church Unitarian in Washington, D.C. All Souls is, Amy is proud to say, All Souls is one of the largest Unitarian Universalist congregations in the world. That's what's in her bio. It's the first time I've seen it printed that way. <laughs> with over 1,000 members. Amy oversees the visitor and new member process as well as works with various lay ministries to make All Souls a welcoming environment to all. She has over 10 years of experience working with a variety of nonprofits and has her master's degree in nonprofit management, specializing in fundraising, membership, and strategic planning. So please warmly welcome Amy. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, uh, welcome. Um, thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Paula, for inviting me here today. Um, and I've really been enjoying so far the conversation this morning. Um, I'm going to speak a bit about membership. Um, and I'm going to talk about a process that we've undertaken at All Souls, which was a way to collect data about our congregation in order to better know ourselves, both in terms of diversity as well as in other ways. Um, so I'm going to walk us through that process um, and hopefully have a good amount of time at the end for questions and comments that might come up along the way. So I, I don't feel like I need to do much background on All Souls. It's already come up several times in the last hour or two. Um, but All Souls is a, is a large UU congregation in Washington, D.C. with over 1,000 members currently. We were founded in 1821, so we're 190 or so years old. Um, but in the last 10 years, we've had a rapid amount of growth. About 10 years ago, we had about 350 members, and now over 1,000. And we have a, a legacy of being a multiracial congregation. Primarily, uh, this was spurred on in the 1960s when uh, we called uh, Reverend David Eden as our senior minister, and he was one of the first called Senior Ministers of Color in the Unitarian, to a Unitarian church. Um, he was not previously Unitarian, um, but he was a very prominent Washingtonian. And with his calling, uh, many African-American families in particular came to All Souls because of that. So over the course of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we became more and more racially diverse, um, both through many more primarily African-Americans coming to the church, but also, to be fair, some white members leaving the church. <laughs> Um, so that is all part of our legacy of being a multiracial congregation in Washington, D.C., which is a very racially diverse city. Um, oh, I think I actually, this was supposed to be an overview, but I just did the next slide. Uh, so I did the background on All Souls Church. I'm going to talk about the current profile project as well as give you a sample for you all to look at. Talk about some highlights of the data that we collected and, what, and lessons that we've learned from that process. So I've been on staff at All Souls for about three, three and a half years now. And when I came, one of the things I was first tasked with was collecting demographics data of our congregation. Um, that this was something that had been swirling around for a while from the perspective of knowing we were racially diverse, but not quite knowing how much, knowing that it had changed throughout the years, kind of ebbing and flowing. Um, and, and frankly, somewhat out of it, I read a sense of anxiety of we were becoming too white or we weren't as diverse as we used to be or where we kind of stood in that. So we really wanted to know who we were so that we could kind of better answer those questions as well as better serve the congregation that we had as well as what we were striving for. Um, so in, over the course of me hearing that, there also was this conversation of getting to know, deepen the involvement with our congregants through kind of a skills and interest survey, which many UU congregations use, many churches use, to kind of help get folks involved. What, what skills do you have? What would you like to offer to the church? So I came up with the idea of kind of fusing these two together into what I called the congregant profile, um, that this was going to be a data collection point that was to get to know the whole you, that it wasn't just to collect demographic race information, it wasn't just 
how can you help the church kind of information, but how can we know who you are as a full picture so that we can better serve you and you can become more involved with the church and deeper, more deeply involved with your church. So the goal of this current profile was uh, three pieces. Uh, to collect contact information, kind of basics that you need to collect from folks, um, demographics information, and skills and interests. Um, actually, I'm going to pass it out right now so you all can look at it while I kind of go through that. And this form, um, all adult congregants were asked to fill out this form, and right now it's currently used with new members. All new members are asked to fill out this form. collecting this data was to make sure that people felt as welcomed as possible, that this was something they wanted to share with their church. Um, so, for example, some of the ways that we tried to do that was several of the questions in the demographics section were open-ended. Um, for example, sexual orientation and gender, as opposed to checking off boxes, you wanted folks to feel welcomed to write down the way that they personally identify. Um, Another example was, you know, if you see kind of in the middle of the page, we asked for children's information. Uh, we asked parents to put down the race and ethnicity of their child, not assuming that it is the same race as, as their parents, as, as, as a reality of many congregations. Um, and another example, um, well, and actually, let me just say why, I guess why two of these are not open-ended. Um, the race and ethnicity question, I, I knew I was going to be doing this kind of presentation with data. And I didn't want to put people into the categories for race and ethnicity. I just thought it was a little bit too, I didn't want that responsibility on my shoulders, to be honest. So that is one where we did put categories. Because I wanted folks to kind of say, this is the, this is the name that I'm putting to the category I identify with. But how it was to be welcoming is that you could check off one or more. And um, I'll show you a little later about how, well, I tracked it this way, that I can literally pull the data from two perspectives on race and ethnicity. I can do a 100% pie chart. So if you checked off more than one, you go into multiracial. Or I can pull everyone who said Asian, even if they said Asian as well as something else. So trying to really honor that uh, all of the identities you carry as opposed to just putting people into one box and that's it. So it was really important that we that people felt welcomed and that they could bring their whole self. Another example, just to share with this, was that the, this question under race and ethnicity about how would you describe your cultural religious tradition, that's the only uh, demographics question that wasn't on the original draft. And this was actually put in at the request of our multiracial, multicultural team at the church. And especially several, uh, several African Americans uh, on that team said, we can't just ask race and have it be a checkoff box. If we put a second question that is open-ended and wants to know the whole you, um, it will get rich information, but also it will feel a lot more welcome to persons of color to say, I'm not just African American. I'm African American, but I was raised in this kind of a church, or you know, to get at this sense of wanting the full picture of you. And uh, another main goal of this, which I, I said, was I wanted to really be able to collect data that then we'd be able to use. Um, I didn't want 
to get a stack of these, and they sat on my desk, and then when someone said, well, how many patients do you have? And I'd go, oh, uh, well, they all got dumped into this other lump category. I'm not really sure. Um, so I actually spent a lot of time in the legwork, but before this was rolled out, um, in making this look as clean and welcoming and inviting as it could, but also on the back end of making sure that our database could track things, so that we wouldn't double count people and kind of inflate our numbers in some way. Um, and, and I really think that's important because, on the other hand, I did not get to spend enough time preparing the back end for the skills and interest, and I have not to this day been able to use this information as fully and as richly as I wanted to because the database I put it into hasn't been as user-friendly as I thought it would be. Um, so it's really important to know where you're putting the data and be able to use it later. Because otherwise, a bunch of people fill this out and then they weren't followed up with, and then they don't really feel that welcome to going forward. Uh, so, as I said, you know, the process of kind of designing this was in consultation with staff and various lay leaders. Uh, the multi multiracial, multicultural team was really the primary group of lay folks that I worked with, but also my membership committee designing this. Um, and the other thing that happened was I had the first draft of this done in January, though the final draft was in May. So anyone who joined between January and May got kind of variations on this. So I was able to test pilot it with some small groups and so that I could see the first time I hit out, did people go, oh, I don't want to fill that out, or I don't understand what this means, or anything like that. So there was some tweaking along the way. Um, so in May of 2010 was when we did the congregational wide rollout of this. Um, this was distributed two ways. One was this hard copy that you all have in your hands. This was in the order of service um, a Sunday, uh, a little later in May. Um, that sermon that day was about the beloved community. It was requested from the pulpit that folks fill this out. It was clearly tied to the mission of our church. Um, and folks were encouraged to fill it out and turn it in an offering plate. Um, we also had an online version that started at the beginning of May and all of our e-newsletters and such, the link was there and encouraging folks to fill it out. <coughs> So I was really excited that I was given the auspicious goal of getting uh, more than half filled out, which is a really high survey rate, if anyone's done surveys. Um, and with a thousand member congregation, that's 500 of these. Um, and I'm really happy to say that kind of by the middle of that summer, we did have nearly 500 of these filled out. And right now, we have almost 900 filled out. Wow. Yeah. Now to the data. Um, so I, I just I pulled some of the demographics information that was collected on here just to give you a sense of a how you could use this data and b what All Souls looks like today. Um, these are all except one marked as children. These are for our adult membership. So you can see our age breakdown is is pretty diverse because I asked for birth date on here in case you didn't catch that in the middle of it. Um, you can see our gender breakdown. Uh, this, this isn't from this, but I think it's really interesting as we continue to talk about the diversity of all souls. The length of membership. Um, at, as you can see, about three quarters, all of this is folks that have joined in the last 10 years. Um, so, that's a reality of our church. I kind of, I was saying this to Reverend John before, you know, All Souls, part of our identity, I think, is in some ways we're this historic church of 190 years. In other ways, we're a 10-year-old church. And we have a mix of those within the congregation. This is the race and ethnicity breakdown of our members. So this is adult members. 77% white. I'm going to go through these in kind of the descending order. 77% uh, white, 11% African descent black, 7% multiracial, meaning people either checked multiracial or checked more than one category. 3% uh, Latino Hispanic, 2% Asian, and the error ability, so that's less than 1%. There's other categories that there is zero, and that's why they're not showing up here. And as a side note, these category names, I, 
I started with, um, I got a recommendation from UUA staff on, on some categories to use, and there were some slight changes with our multiracial, multicultural team, but that's how I came up with how to word those. Uh, our children, 58% white, 24% multiracial, 12% black, 4% Latino, Hispanic, and 2% Asian. Um, so you can see there's a big difference between those two, which I don't think All Souls is unique uh, okay. in that regard. Um, the cultural religious tradition question, um, I think it's kind of, since it was this open-ended question, I think it's, you can understand it better by seeing some of the sample responses. Um, a lot of folks coming from varied paths um, along the way. Mm -hmm. And this is the pie chart breakdown. <laughs> so I think all the samples before fall into multiple phase, but I thought those were more interesting mm -hmm. than people who just went Catholic. Um, but, uh, you know, 28% multiple faiths along the way, 24% mainline Protestants, 21% uh, Catholic, 12% UU. Um, and the way that this question was worded, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Some folks said only how they were raised, some folks said their path to here, some folks said how they identify at this point in time. Um, but that 12% UU is folks that were 100% UU before All Souls. And you know, a real big mix across the board on that one. Oh, sorry, that's a little hard to read. Education. So this, uh, you know, we weren't super interested in education, but rather this was our poor attempt at a proxy for class identification. And again, like unfortunately, many UU churches here are heavily educated. Um, this entire, all of this is bachelor's degree or more. And I'll be honest, several of these less than high school are coming to be students when they join. So, <laughs> so it's not even really quite that. Um, but that's where it breaks down. Sexual orientation, um, you know, 72% heterosexual straight, 21% gay, 3% bisexual, and 3% I categorize that as queer slash multiple orientations. And that's folks that either use the word queer or wrote a few of some combination of these words. Um, and, and one thing I'll point out between this and the gender slide, we do have several transgender members of our congregation, um, and they, that word transgender is nowhere on here. That's because that's not how they wrote. They answer gender, male or female and they answer sexual orientation with one of these words. Um, so that's, that's the reality. It's not to try to make that identity invisible. That's the way that these broke down. Uh, OK, and lessons learned. I'd say that it confirmed many things that we already knew, such as that our children are more diverse than the adults at our congregation. And, then, and I've done different breakdowns of this. Um, it confirmed that most of our growth in the last two years had been white people. It was much greater percentages of white members to persons of color. Um, it helped defend against what wasn't true. For example, I think that that sexual orientation slide, I think that if you had done some informal polling, this would have been all over the map of what people would have thought. And I'm almost certain people would have thought it was gayer than this. Um, so it was interesting to be able to point that out, because I think that All Souls has, you know, especially in certain groups, this identity of being the gay, a gay church, because our senior minister is gay, because we have a lot of leadership that's gay. So this was interesting. You know, it kind of tells you about what the visibility, how that translates to how people feel. Um, I learned that, especially when this is couched in the mission of the church and presented in a welcoming way, there is very little pushback. Um, like I said, I've collected almost 900 of these to this point. 
Um, so I'm sure that there are some folks that didn't feel super welcome and didn't fill it out, but clearly not a ton, um, because that would be a much larger percentage. I wouldn't have gotten nearly as many back. Um, and, and whenever I present this to new members, I always am very clear that you know, fill out as much or as little of this as you feel comfortable. We want to know this about you. We want you to feel welcomed here, but do not check off anything if you don't feel comfortable. And I can tell you that the vast majority of people answer all the questions. Um, a, less than five maybe didn't check, answer the race ethnicity question. Um, and the, the one that's most often left blank is sexual orientation. And I think that points more to the fluidity of that identity. Um, that, that's my guess. But even still, maybe 20 people left that, have left that blank out of almost 900 responses. So it's, people want to share this information. They wanted to say how they, how they identify themselves and be known in that way. Um, I think that the design of it and the communications matter a lot. Um, I think that if we hadn't kind of test piloted it with small groups in advance, kind of work out the kinks, I, I would have hated to put out maybe the first draft because we wouldn't have gotten stuff like the cultural, religious, tradition question because I wasn't there in the first draft. So I think they really, it's important to take the time to put something out that you feel really confident in um, and knowing how you use the data afterwards before you ask for it in the first place. Okay, so I tried to go through that relatively quickly because I'm, I'm very interested in um, speaking with you all and answering any questions you may have. No one else is going to be interested. What software database? <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> um, we use ACS software. Um, so this uh, demographics uh, information is within the people suite model. Okay. And I could go into much more specifics about it if you have ACS or so, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, I, I guess I just want to be really clear about how specifically you told people the data would be used that made them feel welcome and comfortable completing the form. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and since you had online surveys and filling it in and putting it in the in the uh, auction, uh, collection plate, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what specific messages were given to people about it. Mm -hmm. um. We said that this was going to be used internally within All Souls. Um, we were upfront, and I think it's pretty clear the way it's uh, worded, that we were tying these identities to your you as an individual. Um, for example, at the beginning of this, there's the idea of doing kind of more of an anonymous survey to collect census data. And I didn't think that was going to be as worthwhile. That wasn't going to help us figure out, OK, the folks that joined the last 10 years, were they whiter than, than we think? That wasn't going to tell us if a bunch of folks resigned one year. We can now, I can look and see and go, whoa, that was disproportionate to this group. Maybe that had something to do with it. Um, so we were very upfront that it was going to be tied to your own personal record within our database, but that outside of All Souls, your name would never be attached to anything. Um, I said, if, if folks asked, I said, I'd probably use this kind of information that among you use. Um, but that was going to be about it. Um, and the other reason why it was tied to people individually is so that we could then invite them into further relationship among those groups. Um, I don't mean to keep using Asian as the example, but uh, you know, an Asian American Pacific Islander group within our church had started and was doing some events, and I was able to pull a list and go, here's folks who invite to that potluck. These are the folks that identified that way. I'm not making it up, you know, <laughs> that's what they said. They filled out this form. Um, does that answer? Yes. Okay. Um, so having a good set of data is a wonderful place to start because then you, when you keep tracking it, you can start to see trends over time, and getting that initial set is often the hardest part. Can you speak a little bit to um, the vision that, that both you and your congregation has and what your goals are for using this, how you see it useful in the future, and that type of thing? Yeah. Uh, around the same time, our church adopted uh, a five-year 
visioning process. We're closing the second year of that five-year process. And one of the goals was to become more racially diverse as a congregation um, among our adult membership and our children. Um, so having this information helps us know if we're getting there. And I'm excited about that because it's a, a part of our visioning process, which is the very first statement of the overarching vision for the church is to build the beloved community we're going to do all these different things around spiritual development, around community building, around social justice, all through the lens of building beloved community. I'm excited about how that can get further ingrained into our ministries going forward so that that is what's driving the needle change. Um, but it's working. I noticed that the profile doesn't include um, whether someone has like formally joined as a member um, or if they're a visitor or a friend, which are categories that we use at our congregation and perhaps other shoes. I'm wondering if there's any thought behind behind that, not including that kind of categorization. Yeah, um, that's because it was getting put into our database that knows that already. Mm -hmm. And what was great um, when we did this in May of 2010, you know, uh, let's say 20, 25% of the ones that were filled out were non-members. Um, so, and I, and it was a great tool for me from the membership perspective because I went, these are the likely candidates. These are folks that are ready to join. And I didn't do the specific analysis, but I would say a good chunk of those within the next year did join. In terms of knowing what, what you were gonna do with the data, um, some of them seem obvious to me, like what I would do with this data. Others, I'm wondering, did you just add things because you thought, well, this might be useful, or did you have a rationale for every single item, blank, checkbox? Of where it would get captured? Of how we're going to use this. Like, could you defend it at the time, or were you just thinking, well, if we're doing the survey, we're not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. We want to capture as much data as possible. Yeah. yeah. Was there a balance, or did you know? I, I tried to use only stuff that I knew we would use. Um, I think that uh, the best examples is probably on the back, the skills and interests, which I, I didn't talk about as much, uh, though it's very important. Um, these categories, for the most part, were things that already happened at the church. And I also felt strongly about not making this a sign-up list for whatever committee, because I don't think that's as effective, but rather, hey, you know, oh, you're interested interested in graphic design, maybe you want to be a part of our communications team, um, as an example. Um, so pretty much all of those were things that were already happening. A few of them were more forward-thinking of things we aspire to do. And I'm actually about to do a big edit of this.